Major funding for this program is provided by grants from HSH Nordbank, New York Branch, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, Greenberg Traurig, The Moynian Group. Additional funding is provided by grants from C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Fremont Investment and Loan, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Rosenthal and Rosenthal Inc., Signature Bank, Stonehenge Partners, Swig Equities, the Engel Berman Group, Titan Capital, the Wickoff Group. Welcome to Building New York. My name is Michael Stoller. 53 years ago, a person is born in Great Neck. Um, today, this individual is the chairman of the real estate practice, national chairman of the real estate practice at Greenberg Traug, uh, and also a real estate investor. I'm very fortunate today to have Robert Ivanhoe uh, with me today. Thank you, Michael. Pleasure to be here. So you were born in Great Neck. You went to Great Neck High. And you told me that your dad was in the aluminum extrusion building? He was in the aluminum extrusion business, and most of his customers were in the real estate business. They were builders. Now, the interesting thing is many people, you know, with your background, uh, would, you went to John Hopkins. And I think probably because you had that feeling that you perhaps wanted to be a physician? I certainly considered it. When I was applying to Hopkins, I was always a... In high school, I had been a, a strong math and science student, and I liked it, and I thought that medicine was a possibility for me. And uh, so I went to Johns Hopkins with an open mind towards uh, medicine, and most of the, about half of the entering class there uh, were pre-meds. And uh, after about three or four weeks of uh, going to chemistry labs and watching some of the students sabotage each other's uh, lab experiments. I decided that wasn't an environment I wanted to spend five years with, and very quickly I switched out of pre-med and I became a uh, really a, a social sciences major. And then you said to me in your sophomore year, um, they, you, you got a phone call from your dad. Yes. And what happened? Well, uh, I had always assumed that if I didn't become a doctor uh, and and things changed, that I always had uh, the family business to fall back on. My father had two other partners. They all had, uh, 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 ch their children were all d daughters. And so I was the only, uh, the only male among the three partners in the business. And in those days, that really meant that I was the only one who might likely succeed to the business if I wanted to. And I always thought that that might be something I would consider doing if there was nothing else that was interesting to me. My father called me uh, one day when I was in school and he said, well, the boys, meaning his two partners, had decided they wanted to sell the business. And unless I felt very strongly about wanting to pursue it myself, he was going to go along with it. And uh, I said, go ahead and do it. I wasn't committed to going into, the, into his business and I didn't want to interfere with what the three of them wanted to do. And at that point, I had to decide what I was going to do when I grow up, when I grew up. And how did you decide to become a lawyer? <laughs> well, I th I actually, that the following summer, the summer after my uh, sophomore year, uh, I was I was fortunate and had the opportunity to work uh, at the uh, New York State Attorney General's office. At that time, it was Louis Lefkowitz, and I worked in the consumer fraud division just to see if I might like law. And uh, and I found it very intriguing uh, the, the whole idea of practicing law. And I think by the time I got back to start my junior year, I had decided that that's, that was of interest to me. And uh, I was always interested in real estate. That was something that if I was going to go into business that, or How do you have this interest in real estate? Well, it really, I, my, I guess through uh, my father's business, uh, th uh, three or four of his very closest friends were uh, fairly, were all builders. And they were always around. 
uh, the house or, or, you know, on social occasions. And they're always talking about real estate, and it just became uh, something that became a topic of conversation in the house. My father invested in real estate, and he had some holdings himself. And uh, as, as, uh, as the years went on, and then even my sister and brother-in-law both went into a a uh, major real estate development firm here in New York, and it, it continued to be a source of, uh, of conversation in the house, and, and I just found it interesting, and I think I learned, uh, learned a lot through a lot of that as well. You graduate Hopkins, you go to American University for Law. Yes. And during uh, law school, what were you doing during the summers? Uh, most of those, t I had two of the two summers, uh, a summer before I went to law school and one during law school, I, I worked in the uh, in the in Leonard Litwin's uh, real estate business, and he was building. Uh, in those days, he pretty much would build a building a year, and he would have to rent it up. And I would work in different capacities, uh, you know, helping out on some very elementary legal things, or renting apartments, or or renting uh, commercial space, things of that nature. Now, you graduate law school at 25 years of age, and you get a job with the legendary <laughs> real estate. They were the, the they powerhouse, were. Uh, Dreyer and Traub. And, and you told me a very interesting story, because uh, there was really fiefdoms at uh, Dreyer and Traub. And you come up to the office, and they, you know they, each one says, who are you going to work for? So tell me the story. Tell my audience about that story. Well, Dreyer and Traub was a very unusual place. You know, at greenberg Troreg. In New York, we have a 60-lawyer real estate department. I'm the chair of the department, but we all work together as, as a large team. Well, Dreyer and Traub wasn't quite like that. We had some very strong personalities. Most of them were what I would call Brooklyn street fighters, and each of them had their own fiefdom. And uh, the reason I went there was because Leonard Litwin, who uh, I had worked for many summers, was a, is a very, very dear friend of our family. Uh, that was the law firm that his family had used for 50 years before when I went they were to in Brooklyn, Brooklyn on they, Court Street in Brooklyn. Absolutely, absolutely. Leonard Litwin's father used a Dreyer and Traub from the days when they were in Brooklyn. So um, <clears throat> I, I go to work my my very first day, and the office manager greets me, and he starts giving me the tour around the office. And in those days, we were at 90 Park Avenue. We occupied two floors, and he took me down to the lower floor first to start meeting people. And it was 9 o'clock uh, in the morning, and there weren't that many people in. We get to the office of George Ross, now the famous George Ross, the television star from The Apprentice, who was one of the senior partners at Dreyer and Traub at that time. And I go in to meet George. And I had heard his name, but I'd never met him before, and I didn't know very much about him. And I sit down and talk to George for about 10 or 15 minutes. The office manager comes back to continue my tour, and uh, George says, give me a few more minutes with him. And the office manager leaves and comes back in another 10 or 15 minutes to move me along my tour. And uh, George said, who is he working for? And uh, the office manager said, Jerry Schrager. And George says, well, tell Schrager he's stopping right here. And, and that was it. It was that uh, uh, sort of fate of the moment that had me uh, start my career working for George Ross. Now, now George, as most people do realize, that he's the uh, general counsel, uh, consigliere of Donald Trump. Yes. Um, basically, he was a leasing specialist and also other areas. And yes. you became involved. And you told me that one of your first assignments when you were dry and trap was working on Trump Tower, but in a very interesting <laughs> capacity. What was your capacity? Well, you know, w one thing that's very disillusioning when you come out of law school, you, you think you might have some idea what you're supposed to do in the practice of law. And I was at Dreyer and Traub for a month or two, and this big deal comes in where Donald Trump is buying the Trump Tower site, and we were gearing up to work on it, and I was all excited. And then we start reviewing documents, and there are documents going back and forth for the acquisition and a whole bunch of ground leases and loan documents. And I'm looking at things, and I have no idea what anything means and you know what you're supposed to do with these documents. And, and I realized that I really wasn't qualified after three years of law school to do much of anything. And as I continued to work in the deal and we were staying up night after night, I, I was doing very important things like uh, collating, Xeroxing, stapling, getting coffee, ordering food. And that was my big contribution, I think, to the acquisition of Trump Tower. But I think over the years, because at the age of 30, uh, in five years, you were made a partner. Yes. And uh, then 
t 10 years later, I mean, five, another five years at 35, George leaves. That's the right. Firm. And, um, but, uh, and you, and you're, 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 you become one of the four key partners uh, who are running the firm at that time. Well, we, I, I had been on the, uh, the firm's management committee for a while, and as the years went on and there were some uh, other people who had left the firm, uh, they, reorganized the management structure a little bit and because there had been four or five people that had been running the firm for 15 or 20 years and as a few of them left I was added to the group of uh, four people who ran the firm uh, right up until the time I left in uh, January of 1996. But be before 1996 you, you got involved with a uh, office development with Leonard Litwin. Uh, two office, but I mean Leonard Litwin is legendary. Uh, I have the highest regards for Leonard. Um, and at that time, he bought two office buildings, and you were involved yes. in that. Yes. Well, it was, it was a very interesting experience for me. You were involved uh, both as the attorney and also as an investor. Yes. Yes. Uh, we had a client at Dreyer and Traub who was negotiating to purchase two office buildings downtown that had been foreclosed by a lender from Harry Helmsley. And they were trying to sell it to one of our clients. Right. And downtown in this picture, right? That's exactly right. Somewhere right over there. And uh, our client uh, at the time walked away from the transaction at, at the very last minute. The contracts were done, fully negotiated, no issues, because of a dispute with the broker about the way that the brokerage commission was going to be characterized, not the amount of it, not when it was going to be paid, but a characterization question, which really was a tax issue. And so our client pulled out of the deal, and the next night I was having d uh, dinner with my sister and brother-in-law, and I was explaining to them that this was so strange that over something that seemed so minor that this whole deal blew up. And then I d uh, started to describe the deal to them, and uh, my brother-in-law, who is a certainly a very, very bright fellow, especially when it comes to numbers, says, well, that deal could, could not have possibly made any sense. And I said, well, I didn't think it made any sense either, and I became so concerned about it, I started to do some numbers myself, and I satisfied myself that, that at least it wasn't crazy. It was a leasehold that had 22 years left to go, and my brother-in-law felt that it couldn't possibly have been stabilized and produced income quickly enough in order for it to make sense. So we cl quickly ran through some numbers, and he goes, you know what? You're actually right. Uh, maybe, maybe we can go buy the building if Leonard Litwin would ever buy an office building. So the next morning we meet with him and explain the whole deal to him. And he goes, he, he must have just had a very unusual moment in his life, Mr. Litwin. And he decided, you know what, I'm going to go do this. And I called up the, uh, the seller. I first got permission from our client. And he, our client said, fine, if he wants to buy it as long as he picks up, our, picks up the legal fee of Dreyer and Traub. Um, uh, I'll stay, happily stand aside and wish him the best of luck. So uh, we called the seller, and uh, the next day, Litwin signed the same contract that our previous client was prepared to. And in this situation, besides being the attorney, you became an investor. Yes, I became an investor, and I think part of the reason was Litwin had, had absolutely no experience. No one in his organization had any experience with office buildings. And uh, I, at, at that time, I was doing a lot of leasing work. I had worked uh, a great deal on the leasing up of 101 Park Avenue and 195 Broadway for Peter Calico, many other office buildings in New York. And I think Litwin felt that, uh, you know, if I was watching it you became with my own constantly air on that uh, on that a little bit and and that if i had a rooting interest uh, i would i would make sure i was paying closer attention to yeah, what was happening when there. we met we were talking about the cycles of real estate you buy the building the value what what was the purchase price you remember it, it was, the value went up I remember and down exactly. i want to tell you it was quite quite a story the the building was purchased in 1985 for about 39 million dollars uh, about 2 years later it was appraised at the time of a refinancing for over a hundred million dollars because there had been leasing activity and extension of the ground lease and an improvement in the market. That was 1987. By 1990, of course, the world, especially downtown, had changed. Uh, the lender that had made the loan in 1986 or 87 uh, was having the bank examiners in, and the bank examiners required an appraisal, and the, uh, the, the appraisal came in at about thirty million dollars so the value had dropped from over a hundred million dollars to thirty million dollars in three or four years 
and subsequently the buildings were sold when a number a couple the, of years the ago, buildings, I think, about yes, two years ago. The buildings were sold about two years ago for well over a hundred million dollars, about hundred twenty million dollars to a group headed by led by David Warner. Now during during this period of time you had some other passive investments in certain situations and it's nineteen ninety six and the world of real estate was going up and down and you decide to leave Dreyer and Traub and you've kept only two jobs in your life. You, you find this right. little Miami-based law firm. How, how do you find an opportunity with, with this Miami-based law firm? Well, it was it was a very interesting time. The uh, the unraveling of Dreyer and Traub was uh, for me somewhat traumatic, uh, because when I when I left, as soon as I left, the firm actually dissolved. Uh, they they had a meeting a day or two after I left. And at that point, they voted to dissolve. I think they felt that I was the one who was going to be able to carry on after the uh, some of the the other people who had been running it retired. And if the person who they thought was capable of continuing on left, then you know may as well end it now. I think was the the feeling, and they they voted to dissolve. Um, so at, at that time, I I had a lot of different options of going to some large, very well known firms. Uh, and my my number one criteria in where I was going to go, where I was going, was really well, primarily was the kind of people and the working environment that that I was going to become involved with, and uh, and I knew people from Greenberg Traurig. I had uh, worked with them in uh, uh, when I was at Dreyer and Traub, uh, working on transactions in Florida. We used them as local counsel. And uh, they're certainly a fine firm, and they were very nice people. And I knew some people very well in the New York office. And it just seemed like a very, very comfortable, welcoming place where I would be left alone, and I could just do my own work, and, and there wouldn't be bombs going off around me as I walked down the halls. So when you joined Greenberg, the New York office had like 25? 25. I was about the 25th lawyer. And about uh, 125 in total in my... I think it was, yeah, Miami had about uh, one, 150, and the whole firm was about 275 lawyers. And where is it today? Well, today, 10 years later, the firm is over 1,600 lawyers. New York is 350 lawyers. Uh, the New York Real Estate Department, uh, which when I joined it, there were only two people there. Now we're over 60, and the national real estate practice at Greenberg Traurig is over 250, which I think makes us the largest real estate practice of any law firm in the United States. Now, during this period of time, didn't, there was a, uh, the building um, at 17 Battery. Did yes. you invest in that also? No, I wasn't. I was not an investor, but I was. Uh, I was more like an investment banker, I, I, I guess, in that transaction. It was very. It was very interesting. Um, a, a very close friend, friend and client of mine had uh, acquired the building through buying debt on the property and then uh, doing a deed in lieu of, of foreclosure transaction with Arthur Cohn, who'd been the prior owner. And then he held it for a few years, uh, did some lease up, and was looking to sell it. And when it was on the market, another client of mine said, I have a great idea of something to do with 17 Battery, and I'd like to acquire it, but I don't know that I can really uh, establish my position in this horse race unless you help me. So I was able to uh, help this client get uh, a, first, a first place position in, in the bidding for the building. He ended up acquiring the building, and then we had to figure out um, what the best execution for it was. And what that uh, it happened to be this, the time of SL Green's going public, and Green needed to try to bulk up and get enough uh, capacity in, uh, in, into their IPO of new office product in order to have a viable IPO. And uh, the, the business plan for the building turned out to be to take the top of the building, the building, the, the old building, which is the same architect who did the uh, Plaza Hotel, and it's a beautiful old building with a commanding view of the harbor right over there, Michael. It's very prominent in your, in your picture. Um, the, uh, the, the building was about half empty, so the idea was if you took all the tenants and moved them into the lower part of the building, and then you took the upper part of the building and had it either be a hotel or a, an apartment building, and then you um, sold off the office p floors to SL Green plus the North Building at 17 Battery, which is an office building that was built many years later to SL Green. Green would be acquiring um, close to a million square feet of office space, and you'd be left with a very valuable uh, upper floors with this commanding view of New York Harbor. So um, this is actually what we did, and my relationship with Green allowed my other client to, uh, to sell off 
uh, those two parts of the building for, for really what he acquired it for. So he owned the upstairs for essentially nothing. And then and he later sold, sold that to, to Joe Moynian. To Joe Moynian uh, a little right. bit later after he cleared the tenants out. And of course, Joe has gone on and done a very nice residential project in that, in that building. So the vision really did work. But as you said when we met prior, um, you, in the 80s you met Steve Green. I yes. mean, Steve Green was buying these these B buildings. I think Steve Green originally came out of the travel business. He was in the travel business, uh, and and he was Steve Green was actually once a lawyer. Uh, a, well, he still is a lawyer, but uh, practiced law as a, as a litigator. who's a trial lawyer. Then he went to, into the travel business. Uh, he was an avid skier and tennis player, and 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 then decided to go into the real estate business. And uh, by the time I met him, he had gone from doing loft residential loft conversions into take into B office buildings that at the time were mostly small side street older buildings uh, ranging in size from 50 to 150,000 square feet. That was the extent of his portfolio and I guess it's now almost uh, 20 years ago that I first started doing work for Steve and uh, most I think he had about seven or eight buildings of that of that size and description. Yeah, Steve Green has grown as well as you have grown. Uh, and during those years, I mean, I, I'm going to go fast forward in a little while. I mean, your your time at Dreyer and Traub and your initial years at Greenberg, you uh, you were involved with a number of interesting transactions. You mentioned 101 uh, Park Avenue. You mentioned one, 195 Broadway. Yes. Um, you you told me you were involved with the Dirt in Newport. Yes, uh, there when uh, the, when the Lefrax uh, were developing uh, the Newport site in Jersey in, City, in Jersey City, um, and they were, uh, I guess they had the Simons as as their their partners from Indianapolis. Uh, we were involved in in helping with the master planning and doing all the easements and uh... really figuring out how to how to ultimately develop that site and uh... there were some very interesting uh... meetings for a young lawyer to attend but uh, with someone like sam lefrak and mel simon who were two of the all-time legends in the real estate business you know, it's, it's interesting i remember uh... when i uh, had uh, sam's grandson who's going to be on my show this week um, uh, jamie on the show and i said when how Sam decided to go to Jersey City was he was on Battery Park City when he had the residential building mm -hmm. and he looked across the water and he saw he saw Jersey City and he said this is a new port and that's how <laughs> the concept of new port was really created but you were involved with integrated resources yes. and you, you've seen a variety of situations change over the last couple of years, I mean, with the growth of the firm and everything, you've you've been very involved with certain very interesting transactions. Um, two years ago, you represented Elad. Why don't you talk about that? Yes. Well, um, we we had done a few transactions previously for Elad, and and we we had done a lot of development work for them. And the first large transaction I did for them, which was at the time the largest that they had ever done, was when they acquired 225 Fifth Avenue. Uh, and it's you know wonderful landmark building, and it was the first transaction they had ever done that was in excess of $100 million. And uh, it put them a little bit on the map. Uh, but while that was a fairly large transaction, it was not a spectacular transaction that was going to grab very many headlines. Well, a few months after the acquisition of 225 Fifth, uh, I receive a call one day from Mickey Naftali who tells me that he's getting on a plane and he's going over to Singapore to meet with one of the owners of the Plaza Hotel and uh, that I should be on standby in case they were able to forge an agreement because he would need me to prepare a letter of intent while he was over there. So sure enough, I get uh, communication from him while he's over there. Okay, we've reached a deal. I need you to prepare a letter of intent and email it over to me in uh, Singapore right away, which, which I did. And uh, I, I found the whole thing very curious because Mickey uh, is over in uh, Singapore negotiating with the, with the uh, Far Eastern owner, one of, the, one of the two owners who is from the Far East of the hotel. And of course, the other owner is Prince Al-Walid of Saudi Arabia, who uh, 
had been uh, very involved in, in owning that hotel and many other hotels and a large shareholder in both Fairmont and Four Seasons Hotel Companies. And I was wondering whether at some point in this transaction that the, that the prince or his people would start to wonder why they were selling the hotel to an Israeli who had never done very much here. And, and there was always this question in the back of my mind, would something happen along the way that would prevent this deal from moving forward? Well, sure enough, the letter of intent gets signed. They come back. We start doing our due diligence. We go through the contract negotiation. And everything went off without a hitch. And I guess uh, you know the answer to my question was, you know, at the right price and in, 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 in business, uh, business is business. <clears throat> and today, looking back at that, of course, the prince has gone back into the transaction uh, and is a, is a partner with Elod in the uh, hotel component and in the hotel condominium component of the project. So they're actually partners. Mm -hmm. um, changing. Before I talk about a, a very interesting transaction that everyone knows about now, I want to talk about what you are doing yourself as a developer. You created this group called the Strategic Group a couple of years ago for investments. And you, to the, tell my audience a little bit what you're doing at 15 Wall. William. 15 William. Well, um, there's there's a group. Uh, I have really two partners in the in in this group, and I'm I think I'm the most passive of the of the three of the three in the group, but I have a few investors who uh, who have invested some money with me, and I. Uh, act as a fiduciary with regard to their investments. And uh, I have then two other partners. One is uh, Larry Davis, who is the former uh, president of Emmis Realty, which was one of the large asset management uh, firms in, in New York that uh, did a lot of the, uh, during the distress days, helped uh, work out a lot of the portfolio that people like Apollo and Blackacre and North Star acquired. And, at one point, I know that they uh, they managed and asset managed many million square feet here in New York City and many many apartment buildings around the New York metropolitan area and nationally. So, uh, a little over a year ago, uh, Larry left uh, Emmis and uh, became the CEO of SDS Investments, and SDS stands for Sapir, which is uh, Tom and Alex Sapir of uh, Czar Realty. Uh, they're they're the uh, the main backer of this enterprise. Uh, uh, D stands for Larry Davis, and S stands for Strategic, which is myself and uh, some investors. And there you're building a 400,000 square foot condominium yeah. tower with yes. Andre Bellage. Yes, and, uh, Andre Bellage is adding the sizzle and the and the uh, the style and the branding, and uh, and we have uh, it's at the intersection of William and Beaver Streets. So we've created uh, at, 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 uh, through Andre's creativity a little uh, cartoon character called William Beaver that's, whose pictures are around everywhere to promote this new project. I, I re time is short, but I just, you know, I, I want to say, because one, one transaction that you're doing now, and but uh, we're complete uh, time out, uh, is um, you were involved with MetLife in the sale of the yes. Cooper Village, which is the largest purchase ever uh, of a property $5.4 billion. It's closing this uh, Friday. Right. <laughs> so, Rob, uh, I would say that uh, in your career of two jobs, of 28 years in the, in the legal business, you have been involved as a counselor, advisor, consigliere, and an owner and a developer of New York, and I'm very happy that you're a guest today. Thank you, Michael. It was my pleasure. Okay. Major funding for this program is provided by grants from HSH Nordbank, New York Branch, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, Greenberg Traurig, The Moynian Group. Additional funding is provided by grants from C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Fremont Investment and Loan, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Rosenthal and Rosenthal Inc., Signature Bank, Stonehenge Partners, Swig Equities, the Engel Berman Group, Titan Capital, the Wickoff Group.